the way, that's um, that's actually the reason why um, IDE's kind of got worked into this talk is because of Eric, actually. Because I was sort of battling about stuff that I was thinking about maybe coming to NoFun and talk about, uh, and he was like, oh, so you're making an IDE? And I was like, yeah, yeah, let's, let's just go with that. And I thought, sort of thought it was a good way, a good way to kind of, uh, because everyone kind of knows what IDE is. I, I kind of, I, I, I kept that. Um, so I just got um, I just got in town like right off the highway. I'm from uh, I live in Mobile. Uh, I work at the University of South Alabama. So um, I'm just going to try to get settled in here. Uh, a little bit about me. I was actually born in New Orleans, um, and I went to uh, my my I have no connection to Louisiana at all. My parents um, were Tulane professors, and they moved to um, uh, University of Georgia, which is where I went to college. I ended up back in uh, Louisiana, uh, LSU, which is where I um, got a little bit of exposure to the you know, group um, a few years ago. And after I graduated there, I um, got my PhD and started working at the University of South Alabama. Uh, while I was a graduate student, I got... innovation of programmers to have the speakers sit down while he's talking, which is pretty nice. Um, so um, while I was a graduate student, I got exposure to Haskell, and that was really the first time that I decided I liked programming. And um, and uh, and then after I went to USA, I tried Python, which was a really interesting transition from Haskell to Python. And then um, after a few months of Python, I started getting frustrated with kind of the limits of it because it's really not a language that you would, you know, develop an application in. So um, I decided that I would just take the plunge and just kind of go all the way. In some sense. And so I just figured um, C++ was kind of an interesting option, so I went with that. So long story short, I've been doing that for about two years. I mean, going into C++ took about a year off my life. Um, I got, um, I started, right around that same time, I started this keyword project, which got me interested in all kinds of cool things. Um, so um, the Atreus uh, keyword was a really early model that I looked at. Um, that's also uh, the Atreus guy is in, in the Clojure community, I think. Um, the Ergodice keyboard is another really interesting model. QK keyboard firmware, uh, really powerful. Like I, I sort of only dabbled with like, the tiniest piece of that. Um, it can do, um, do some amazing things. Um, Arduino and the Teensy um, microprocessor. And, uh, and then I decided, uh, for what for my project, I decided I needed to just uh, design, design a PCB myself. And uh, so I learned KiCad to do that. And this was all happening at the Mobile Makerspace, so shout out to those guys. Um, uh, that's probably Rick's hand, I'm guessing. Um, and uh, I, so there's my uh, schematic for the uh, for the PCB and the case that I closed, and so on. And there it is. So um, I made this keyboard, and I was telling Eric that I had this. I did have it at the time. I was putting it together, and uh, I said I was going to bring it. He was like, "Cool, bring it." And so you're wondering why I don't I have it? And the reason I'll tell you in a second. But here are some more pictures this is from the back. Um, this was the soldering. I had to show off my soldering. That was really hard. I burned myself. Um, and there it is, plugged in. And uh, there's my Hello World. The day I tested it. Um, it worked. I had to actually I had to pull out one of the wires out and solder to a different pin, but uh, it worked. And um, so on December 22nd, I was heading back to um, Georgia, where my mom lives. I go home for Christmas usually. And um, in between Montgomery and Auburn, um, my, my I had a flat tire on the side of the road. Interestingly, it was a full moon that night. I should notice that later. Um, my car was uh, broken into. The window was smashed. And uh, I had all that stuff in the back, so it was it's gone. And... Uh, it was inter interesting. They had, there was I had a box of books in the back of my car, and this uh, my C++ book. They left that. They didn't want that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
got some other stuff. I guess the books were too heavy. So they turned my car off. Um, this tow truck, tow truck driver guy was pretty interesting. And I went home and had Christmas dinner. 2019 came and, and went. And now I'm doing um, a little bit more with, I decided I really liked hardware, so I took a, I'm taking a class in VLSI and learning about IC design, which is really fun. Um, I'm not really very deep into that, but I just I just decided I really like um, I like kind of the sort of stuff. It's just it's, it's fun. So I'm continuing to do that. Um, so now uh, I want to talk about C plus plus and um, say some stuff about the project. And um, I wanted to make sure that some of the stuff I say is actually correct. So this part of the talk, I'm going to try to sort of tell you things that are definitely, I can definitely say are true. Uh, I'm kind of going a lot off of um, things I've read by Scott Myers, for example. So this is a Hello World uh, in C++. Uh, you, may, you may be familiar with the language. Um, if, you want to, uh, if you want to do multi-threaded uh, C++, you can. Um, you include this uh, thread header. And uh, so here you see I have two jobs. And uh, I create my two thread objects and give them my jobs. Um, and that will. Uh, let's see if I try this. This is going to be my first go at this. Um, let's see what happens if we run that. So the, uh, it says lib C ABI die lib terminating. That's because the uh, std terminate was called um, because. What's happening is that these threads are, um, at the time when they're just one of their disruptors is called, which is here, uh, they are considered joinable. And if a joinable thread's disruptor goes off, the program, the entire program terminates. So um, that's not, that's actually not, it doesn't mean that your program, it just doesn't mean your computer's going to be melt or anything. That's actually um, a language level uh, safety mechanism to just. It's just basically saying never do that. They're just sort of banning it. So if we um, if we uh, if we if we want to do multi-threaded programming, so I don't need that. I can just add this in. Um, so if we join the threads, now it works. Um, so. In, there's also another way to do um, multi-threaded stuff, which is called what's called task-based. So if you include instead this thing called feature, um, you can uh, set up a job. So this job, I, um, I have three arguments, and it does something. And uh, I call the type, I call the return type long, just so it's different. And uh, so you can see here, um, I'm creating what's called a feature, and uh, this feature is a type long. And um, what is what is the way I'm producing this feature is by calling std async, and so I'm doing the same similar thing to what I was doing before. Um, I have a job and I'm passing in some arguments, um, and uh, the way this works, the way a feature works is um, the way I think of this as is it's kind of like a um, I think of it as an asynchronous uh, read. So the idea is that um, it's it's kind of a um, it's kind of a, it kind of feels like voodoo, and the reason is because it's actually sort of alive. It's actually a thread, um, and it's actually you know, running asynchronously somewhere, um, and it's and it's checking something. That thing it's checking is called the shared state of the future, um, and it's sort of um, you think of the other side of that as being sort of like a promise or some some something on the other side that it's communicating with. And the way that futures work is they're passing their job their results off to anyone who. What I like to call it is subscribes to the future. So here I have a, a, a wait call. That's one way to subscribe to say, you know, hey, hey, future, I'm interested in that, that job you're doing. There. Um, but I've commented that out because it's not necessary. If we call get, this will um, this is the same. It's going to it's going to do the same thing as wait, but it's going to do it's going to do an extra extra bit and actually return the value. Um, so we can uh, just uh, sort of uh, have a little. A uh, bit of reality, reality check with that. Um, you can see that it, it works. Um, so, um, what is the difference between the, 
the, the thread thing that I was doing and the task based thing. Um, well, the first thing uh, uh, is that they're actually they're, they're both using the same resource, um, which is uh, software threads. So your operating system provides software threads, it may be window threads, Windows threads, or POSIX threads, or something. Um, and that's that's the resource they have. You can think of them as language level wrappers around that resource. And um, they what they both do is they both implement the C++ 11 memory model and C++ 11 standard concurrency specification. I'm not sure if that's the right way to phrase that, but basically saying here is that um, C++ 11 it was a really big deal. They came up with this memory model, and um, this was it took them years to do this. So um, if you kind of think of it that way, like they wouldn't, they wouldn't be like doing this again to like have some separate thing. This is all the same thing. So the difference between std thread and the task-based stuff is just a matter of lower versus high level. It's the same stuff. Um, what this, what you get when you use std async, or you can use std package task, or you can use a promise. What you get with that is that it will handle certain kinds of exceptions that otherwise you have to handle yourself, and it will. Uh, also adjust to different platforms, so the, the language doesn't know what platform you're using. So you know, it's, um, it's, it's designed to work well on any platform, um, not just necessarily the one that you tested your program on. Um, and, uh, and it will take steps to avoid things like overprescription, it will also do some kind of load balancing. So you get all those goodies, and they're, they're constantly being updated as the language is updated. You get all those goodies when you use task-based calls. Um, when, you, when you use std thread, um, you don't get any of that, and, but in return you have more control. Um, and uh, it may be, it may be inter of interest to you to use std thread because it exposes the, the native API, um, I think to some extent. Okay, so um, if, we, if we jazz this up slightly, uh, we could do something like having, um, here's the same job, uh, here's my feature again, and um, something that you get with uh, async uh, or uh, a task-based call is uh, a wait for command, which allows you to do something that would be perfectly reasonable. You want to sort of wait for a little while, but don't wait forever if something if it hangs for some reason. And in that case, uh, of course, uh, you can. You know, it's a nice thing you have. You can branch uh, branch your program versus the times out or it does not. So. Um, Oh, and here you have the, uh, um, a nice uh, namespace in C++ allows you to, in C++14 allows you to uh, write your seconds, your milliseconds, your nanoseconds, and that way, which is nice. Uh, so if we, if, we, um, if we do this, it didn't time out. Um, so let's see, if we... Um, didn't time out. Um, one millisecond. Nope. So let's try one nanosecond. Time down. Okay. All right. So, um, so uh, the thing about this is that actually, if you look at what 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 we've written here, we have our feature, we have our study scene, we have our job. Actually, this function is not guaranteed to run immediately. Um, so, I don't know, maybe you care about that. Uh, if you do care about that, um, there is something you, extra you can pass in, which is uh, this uh, launch policy. So there's a, a launch policy, which is called std launch async, and that means, what that means is run this immediately. I don't care whether uh, you want to subscribe to it, just just run it, I want, the, I want this job to be done. Um, another, uh, possible, another possible launch policy is std launch deferred, which will defer the job until someone subscribes to it, and then it knows that it needs that, right? It's kind of like a lazy uh, uh, policy. Um, and of course, with the job, this would really make much difference. But you have that option. Okay. Okay, so um, so that's a little bit about um, the, the difference there. Um, a little bit of C++, maybe to hopefully what your appetite or um, Compare that to whatever your favorite your favorite platform is. Okay. So, um, uh, so what about IDE. So, what do we think of when we think of IDEs? Um, well, 
you know, if we think about the, the compiler framework, um, you have you have your source code, which is tokenized and parsed to create something called abstract syntax tree. There you have type checking and optimizations performed, and eventually, eventually you get to your um, your actual um, machine code, your ones and zeros for whatever architecture you're using. And the way I think of, I mean, the way I could think of an IDE is kind of going from this level, which was a text editor level, to the IDE level, which is actually editing your, your syntax tree. It knows what you're, you know, it knows, it actually is doing the parsing and, and recognizing what you have here. Um, and, you know, IDEs come with all kinds of, all kinds of goodies nowadays, really good IDEs out there these days. Um, so like indexing, um, build tools like Make or CMake or Gradle, um, an IDE should probably come with a debugger, um, syntax highlighting, kind of like futuristic AI uh, IDE or something. Um, and we're not really going to talk about that. Um, and uh, um, so what, what I'm really thinking about is something that was motivated by some of my older things. And that's uh, and the idea is an application for the free use of language. So what do I mean by that? Um, so if we, I'm going to go for some examples here. Of course, we could probably, yeah. it's a very broad thing to talk about. But um, something that kind of strikes my fancy is language invention. So for example, uh, I think about someone like Lewis Carroll. It was Brillig and the Slicey Toast and Gyre and Jimble in the Wave. All oh, Mimsy were the Borogos and the Momo Reyes uh, So 11 words in this stanza are completely made up by, by this author. Um, um, let's see this. Uh, you may have heard of the Jabberwock poem by Lewis Carroll. Um, and the idea is that um, uh, and, and if we if we look at, uh, for example, Shakespeare, uh, you can Google how many words did Shakespeare invent? Uh, 1,700 words according to Google. I don't know if that's an exaggeration. Um, but uh, I was actually, uh, I knew that he invented a lot of words, but I didn't know he I was surprised by it. Um, and, you know, I guess my question is, would Shakespeare's, this invention, this sort of, this fountain of invention of Shakespeare, have flourished in our time with our platforms. Um, and, of course, that's a very broad question um, and uh, a very broad issue. But if we think about things like uh, distributed version control systems, for example, right? I mean, this is this is a really heavy-duty engineering marvel that we have, and we have um, uh, the distributed version control systems you know, uh, unlock the uh, potential, this enormous potential for uh, communities uh, collaborating and sharing software. Um, tools, applications, libraries, you name it. If we look at languages and operating systems, if you go to that level, um, on the other hand, these at this level, things are one-way mirrors, really. And they're more slow moving, they're more inertial. And, you know, we can weigh this, uh, we can weigh this, but it seems to me that the way things are set up, if we can solve distributed version control, if we can sort of transform software in this way, to remember software wasn't always this free and open collaborative. Maybe uh, we can uh, do the same uh, at the language level. So that's an argument. Uh, other um, models of, and work that people are doing, and if you, if any of this here that you haven't heard of, um, uh, I would really strongly recommend you Google some of this. Um, any of this that you haven't heard of, uh, Brett Victor, does anyone know Brett Victor? Yeah, um, he's amazing. Uh, you know. Um, both of these talks are amazing. Michael Nielsen um, has a project called Magic Paper. Um, Ken Perlin, um, Chalk Talk, that was kind of a predecessor or motivator for Nielsen's work. Um, Jamie Vickery uh, with his globular package, um, something I got exposure to as a graduate student. So um, these are kind of uh, models that I've, I was drawing on as I was trying to put together what I had in mind. Um, if we look at math and science and engineering, we see um, versions of language that sort of transcend the framework of programming, so like think of the Penrose diagrams, or uh, the kind of uh, equations that sort of crop up in knot theory, and the kind of diagrams that crop up in category theory, 
Um, you can go into science and find examples of this, engineering. Uh, we, could, we could talk all day about all, the, uh, all this. And my work, I was doing uh, something called visual type theory, um, which was, um, you know, I don't want to talk forever about that. Um, and uh, I was sort of, I'm working on extending that to something called Settle, um, which also I'm not going to talk about. <coughs> the IDE project is motivating, motivated by those projects because I was putting, trying to put together something that um, would provide application level support for these things. Um, but uh, I didn't see any reason to, you know, um, sort of hardwire those things in. So that's where this, this idea comes in. Um, something that, uh, something that I'm um, working on building into this is um, the idea of skins for language. So um, a language, language design at point of use is something that I think we can distinguish from the language design at point of specification. Um, and I think this is eminently possible. There's actually no reason why we can't do this if we can have code completion, if we can have all these goodies. There's no reason why languages couldn't be skinned. Um, and um, we just haven't done it. Um, of course, people could uh, start to, uh, I mean, if there's a certain attitude or a certain, I mean, maybe there are reasonable kind of arguments for this idea. Um, I just want to point out um, things that could. Uh, the, the difference between uh, one skin and another matters, right? So here's some text. Here's some text with a spatial text adjunct. Right? So is this different from this? Uh, I think so. Right? So the spatial text adjunct is something that um, is, in, is, in, is, is not part of the grammar of this language, but it's something that, that's present and is, is highly influential on how it's how it's understood, or it's meaning this. So, um, so you know, writing an application is hard. Um, you need to develop a front end and back end. Um, uh, that's both of those are big jobs. So I'm just going to say a little bit about um, the. I'm just going to say a little bit about it. Um, for a front end, you have various uh, core libraries to provide your your underlying support, you know, these are not the kind of things that you want to develop yourself. Um, you should probably use something um, to, uh, to sort of bootstrap your project. Um, uh, if, you're, if, if you're not familiar with, with Dear Ingui, I really recommend that uh, as, a, as a really nice thing. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's got a very short, um, compact uh, uh, course. Uh, it's very readable. So check that out. I think that, I'm pretty sure that that is Omar Cornet. And so for the back end, um, it's easier said than done. This was something that I was working on, kind of getting the front end up. And um, like in the fall, I started thinking on the back end and just realized it was really, really hard to do this. Like much harder. I was just completely blown away by how hard it was. And um, 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 right now, I'm working on, I'm still working on the back end. Uh, and the front end doesn't hold until the back end is ready. The model that I'm taking for the front, for the, the back end is uh, of a front end furnace. The idea that something put it into something and it comes out with the underlying idea. Um, and uh, I'm working on kind of a um, asynchronous evaluation method. And the goal is to have um, interthread communication between not individual threads. Um, which is not difficult to set up. We saw how promises and features can do that. Um, but uh, for between pools of threads, so maybe you're communicating, but you don't know which thread you're actually communicating with. You're just communicating to some thread and some pool. Um, GPU threads can't be used for this. Um, they GPU threads are CMB threads. Um, they don't. They're they're sort of rigid in a sense. And uh, I think that, um, I think, and if you want to uh, uh, debate this with me, uh, feel free, but it seems to me that this is going to require uh, using std thread. I don't see a way to do this using task-based calls. Um, 
So take that with a grain of salt, but that's how I'm proceeding. Um, so the design pattern, pattern I'm working on is actually a general, more general thing that I need. I'm calling it a thread line factory, um, similar to event sourcing, which if you've seen that. Um, so uh, to give you a rough idea of this, uh, I have a, um, uh, a class here that I wrote, which is um, just a very basic, kind of very basically functioning class. Uh, it's sort of performing the role of these pools. Um, this is the domain. So if you go to here, um, my, um, so let's see. Okay, so here we have a basic struct um, for a thread I.O. And here we have another struct for cable I.O. This is empty. Um, uh, the idea is this is a base class, right? Uh, here we have a cable um, class. It's inheriting from something that I call a craft. Um, that's sort of, the craft is just there to sort of give it, make it a little bit um, easier, to, easier to work with. Um, and there are various template arguments. So this here is a uh, function pointer um, for the job that we want to run. So that's passing in the job in some sense. And this is another uh, job just to kind of for fun to add that in. Um, here we have some uh, fields uh, and a constructor. So for our constructor, we're going to sort of initialize things. Uh, and the one, one important thing we need to do is to set the uh, ID of each thread. Um, then uh, we have a function I call control. So control actually is what gets called, and control actually does the job of calling uh, the, the, um, what you call the critical section of the, the job, the, um, the actual work. Um, and I stuck in some I stuck in some uh, sleeps so this will not you know, go to the wire if we run it. Um, and here is the API for this class. You have a uh, you have and this is kind of just playing around to get our hands hands uh, hands dirty. We can stop it. We can start it. Um, so it gives us a little bit of uh, flavor for what it does. Uh, here are the um, here's for template programming, you have to um, <laughs> you have to do this. Um, these are uh, these are the um, declarations for the, uh, the classes, the static classes for this um, subject. Okay, so if we go um, over here to this header, what you see is what um, you can think of this as the library code, and then this would be something that. Um, the library user could write. Here I'm inheriting from the base class and I'm just sticking in some things. I, I'm inheriting from the other class and I'm just sticking in whatever I think I need. And here I've, decided, I've defined my jobs, right? So I have a job here, I have a job here. They don't do anything, but they could. Uh, and if we go through the main function here, um, I'm calling, I'm just declaring uh, something to sort of start it. And here is uh, a cable. Uh, so I declare a cable with five threads, um, and I pass in uh, my stuff. Uh, and here I'm just kind of um, playing around with it to sort of see what it does. And if you, if you run this, you'll see. So we'll perform the function. So this is good. This is actually. Uh, Getting this to work, um, it's actually uh, it's actually receiving its ID, and this is persisting uh, over time, and um, the threads are exiting and pausing uh, as so we're controlling. We have control over these, over these threads. Um, if we uh, if we create another one of these cables, I call this cable two. See is that uh, an assertion will fail, and that's because it should not uh, be, you should not be doing that. It's the way this is set up, um, the way template programming works is that uh, the, the, the class that you define is uh, is actually written into your source only if you use it, if you actually use it. So um, the use of uh, the use of the same identical class is going to 
it's actually going to cause these two cables to be writing to the same memory, which is something that I would avoid. Um, if I simply change this in any way, so for example, if I have two threads instead of five, So, um, so that's the um, that would give you the uh, pools that you need. And now you can add the, um, the data structures for the back end. So that's what I'm working on now. Is what I'm doing that. Um, hopefully, cleaning up this code a little bit. I have some ideas to improve it. Um, so um, I started this project uh, kind of with the idea of just kind of making an application. Um, and uh, I just had something in mind that I wanted, right, at the user level. And um, I wasn't thinking at the time, but you know, I was thinking of just writing on a computer. Um, but uh, since I've been working on this, I've been thinking a lot about what is actually inside of a computer. And, um, it's actually, uh, it's actually not the the hardware on a computer is not really optimal for what I have in mind, which has raised a lot of interesting questions for me. So I'm kind of weighing uh, sort of where to take this, um, push it in various directions. Um, so um, I want to do more. Uh, uh, I want to sort of finally get to the, the origin point of this, which is to add some, uh, which actually get into the language level. Um, and I would like to uh, get more into uh, compiler design, computer algebra, um, informal semantics, which is again sort of my background. Um, and I'm also thinking about um, setting up a web platform for this and weighing some options for that. So, um, uh, so, yeah, Eric, thanks for having me out to talk about this. And, um, found I'm sorry there was no demo. I tried to I tried to get one together, but I just I kind of walked the last minute. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for thanks for listening.
Yeah, there's. Um, are you familiar with Company Cock? That's a. Um, that's kind of a. It's in the. It's kind of in this. In this. Uh, in this vein, like, like you're kind of uh, giving a lot of support. I guess like user level support to to Cock. I mean, Cock. Like, I mean, the people who make Cock are very. Uh, I don't want to use the word hardcore, but you know, like they're very. Uh, To their their way of doing things, and, um, so uh, the, but the company cock uh, project was an effort to sort of make it a little more user friendly, more for a general audience. Uh, so you <coughs> might check that out if you're a user of cock yourself. But. Yeah. So. Yeah, we met it. Um, that would be really cool. If, like visual type theory is like was developed for math. Um, so um, I don't know. I mean, math. I mean, you know, um, like there are a lot of layers to math. You know, um, so like, I mean, how are you going to multiply matrices in your ID? That could take months to, to set that up. You have something particular in mind, so. But uh, eventually, I would like to get to um, the level of yeah, that you know, like that would be like kind of for abstract mathematics. You know? um, so I hope to get there eventually. For that kind of stuff specifically, you should look at the APL. Yeah, that's something I've been really wanting to do. Yeah. I'm like, I'm trying to. They have all the specific. Oh, that would be really, yeah, I'm really curious. Um, yeah, I, like I kind of, I fell into the rabbit hole of C++, like black hole, you know, just trying to escape, you know, so, but that, that's interesting to hear about that. Why? Yeah, I mean, I, so I, I, I told you, like, I went from Haskell to Python, and then, and then switching into Python was, and then out of it again, was such a traumatic experience. That I just I just wanted the language that I would never have to stop using. It. So, um, but now I mean now I mean really I have I mean I I don't know you know you might be able to pull me away from C plus plus at this point. Yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. <laughs> I love Haskell. Yeah. I feel like I missed something important. What do? What does threading have to do with like web design? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um. So some of that, like, I'm like, I'm deliberately like, not talking about because I'm kind of trying to, um, trying to write it up, and um, it's just kind of difficult. I mean, it's kind of difficult to sort of thread that needle. Um, but uh, what does threading have to do with like? Um, I guess nothing like nothing with language design, but it would be with um, the use of the language and specifically uh, a language like a, an ordinary programming language is that you think of using an interpreter or using um, running a compiler um, is is there to sort of generate binaries, and that's the traditional idea of, of a programming language. Grace Hopper or something, some story like that. And um, uh, I guess I'm thinking about if you if you watch the talk by Brett uh, Brett Victor, uh, uh, the one of the, the future programming languages, he talks about this like how uh, if you go back to the the past of programming and you can see how um, we've become fixed in a certain mindset uh, for thinking about uh, how program how programs work. And that's, I mean, that's understandable. You know? that's, that's perfectly understandable. This is really chaotic and really hard and really expensive. But, um, but uh, one of the things he talks about is how hardware has changed. I mean, hardware has changed profoundly. And um, a lot of, a lot of the, um, if you go back to the, like, the early ideas about what where programming would go, um, 
lot of them, a lot of people sort of anticipated that um, once we had these kind of threaded, multi-threaded systems that we have now, um, languages and, and systems would be completely different. But they just aren't. They're the same, they're like 60s level tools, they've just been like kind of incremented and you know, evolved like from that kernel. They haven't been like a, a sea change transformation. Um, and so I guess this is kind of an effort to sort of go in a different direction. But I'm, I'm worried because I think it, it's, it's coming up to the limits of, um, of our hardware. You know, we have four cores, and that's it for, you know, for our, our ordinary computers. So, what this, what this is, what this is, I don't know. You know I don't know what it's going to be good for. But, so I'm not sure if it's just going to devolve into kind of a, a hair-brained experiment, or if it'll um, be something that you want to download and use yourself. I don't know. Hope that answers your question. <laughs> start this has been um, I'm glad I did this even though like I said it took years off my life and it distracted me from my math research um, but uh, it's been it's been a lot of fun I wouldn't have wanted to learn programming you know any other way yeah, yeah thanks for coming out I wish I could have talked more about that actually. Um, but uh, anyway, I talked about something else.
Yeah. Uh, yeah. Great question. Um, I think. Uh, I think. That the, yeah. The idea is to distribute it, distributed language development, you know, kind of uh, in the sense of distributed version control. Um, uh, you kind of did. Uh, I would like to see language development be as chaotic as you know as possible. Because I think that's how good language happens. Yeah. Um, which isn't to say that, you know, I mean, there's something to be said for like you know, standard committees and careful you know, engineering and so on. But, uh, but there's just also be something to the wisdom of the crowd. You know? I, I think that also ties into, even though you might not have said anything about Shakespeare, uh, I think that probably you might have been better than saying. So yeah. It's, so whether or not they're new, so if you're expecting a new language, something's got to understand. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. That's exactly that's exactly the idea, right? I mean, because they, they're not really new words. Yeah. Right? Uh, they're nudges, yeah. right? Just nudging the language in one direction or another, and that's just something that you know, like we we can try to sort of nudge languages and nudge committees to make changes to languages, but it's sort of this slow, grueling process. And, you know, people can work for years preparing a proposal, and to no avail, it can just be turned, it can be denied, and nothing, you know, all that work can be for nothing. But maybe, uh, maybe there could be a different way of doing this, where maybe community, maybe some sub-community that likes this thing can, can use it. Um, uh, I don't, you know, I don't see why we couldn't, if we press in that direction, um, given, like, speed of processors now. I don't see why we couldn't achieve something like that. Maybe to the betterment of you know languages.